Thank you very much. I'm going to talk oops, briefly today about the critical role that women play in preventing and ending conflict. Um, and most of you know that women are rarely the perpetrators or combatants during times of conflict, but yet they overwhelmingly face the brunt of the conflict. Um, sexual violence is rampant, and you all know that, that in times of conflict, women um, become part of uh, the civilians that are um, that rape is very often used as a tool of war, um, and they are the innocent victims of, of what is going on on the ground. Um, women also shoulder the burden of caring for their families and the rest of the community when infrastructure and services break down. Um, despite the women very rarely participate in peace negotiations or have a voice um, in post-conflict arrangements. Since 1992, less than 10% of peace negotiators have been women. Um, and this is critical because over the last decade, there has been worldwide recognition that not only should women, um, should peacekeeping operations recognize and attend to women's needs during times of conflict, that includes physical and um, security needs, but also financial needs, day-to-day -day needs that um, they need to have taken care of, um, and that women should be part of peace processes that the very participation of women in these peace processes peace agreements will be more sustainable and that the post-conflict nations will be more democratic. And why? Well, again, there's been this growing recognition worldwide that investment in women pays off. Women invest more in their families and their communities. And when women are involved, whether it's in times of conflict or not, the entire nation will be better off. Um, I'd also like to add that women, because they are more likely to mediate disputes and build trust between parties, that they are more likely to prevent conflict from actually happen, happening. So it, women are key in, in preventing and resolving conflict before conflict happens, during conflict, and after conflict. Um, it, sorry, something just flew by. Um, during times of um, when the conflict has ended, and you're talking about nation building or rebuilding, um, what women there, when women are part of the process, they are able to influence the creation of the legal and constitutional frameworks. And so they are not only able to ensure that women themselves have equality, but they also do tend to ensure that the result of the nation is more equitable, which benefits everyone else. Um, there's also been a growing recognition that the services provided post-conflict in terms of job creation or employment schemes, that they have to involve women as well as men, especially since these conflict countries, women tend to make up 40% of the households. So we need to have them be part of the uh, job creation. Um, there has also been a recognition that when women are um, provided the opportunity to be service providers in this new nation, service providers like uh, members of the police force or uh, public health workers, that they increase the uh, services provided to women and girls and therefore that benefits the entire country. So um, because my presentation is short, um, I just wanted to say that I added two um, sites where you can go look at these issues. The first one is on the UN Women's site regarding women, peace, and security. Um, and the second one I'll address in a couple minutes as well. But uh, my co-panelist, Cece Sloan, and I, we represent UN Women, which is the global entity for gender equality and women's empowerment. UN Women oversees the UN's efforts on behalf of women, peace, and security. And women, peace, and security is one of the five program areas um, that UN Women focuses on. Um, Women, Peace, and Security, this program area is based on five UN Security Council resolutions. And the first one of those, oh, um, I'm not gonna name them all and I'm not gonna explain them all, but they are very well, um, ex they're explained very well in this first document that I have up here. And they give um, um, information on where you can find um, further information on these security re uh, resolutions and what's being done. But the, the main UN security resolution is um, Resolution 1325, which was groundbreaking. And it was groundbreaking because for the very first time, it recognized that conflict affects women and girls differently than men and boys. And it said that women therefore had to be included in peace processes. 
Following, there were the, um, the other four um, Security Council resolutions, and they address uh, different types of issues, including one that recognized that rape is a war crime, the one that calls for the peacekeeping operations to address sexual conflict, uh, sexual violence during conflict, which was not a given. Um, peacekeepers were not, they were torn as to whether they were, um, whether their mandate included protecting civilians. They were there to um, mediate between the warring parties, but because women were civilians and not part of the perpetrators, they didn't know if their mandate um, was clear in, in terms of what, uh, whether they should protect these civilians, these women, but now it is. Peacekeepers need to protect women on the ground. And finally, um, part of these uh, uh, Security Council resolutions address the issues of war reparations for sexual violence, which is also a new thing, relatively new um, in terms of um, global justice. And it also works to prevent immunity for perpetrators of sexual violence in um, times of war. So in practical terms, I just want to give two examples of what the programming means. Most of you know about uh, Darfur and what happened to the women there in the refugee camps and how when they went out to collect fireworks that they would be um, uh, raped. Um, and so UN Women was able to partner with the UN mission on the ground as well as local police and tribal leaders and they trained women to become medical service providers for other people in the refugee camps and they also uh, trained women refugees um, in safety measures such as walking in groups, carrying a whistle and whatnot so that they would be safe. So it's one practical matter in which UN Women works. Um, and another one, is, um, another example is, can be seen right now in Mali, and this is part of the, the bigger work that UN Women does in terms of political participation. Um, the conflict in Mali is not over, it is not resolved, but UN Women for over a year has been working to train women's groups in Mali. Um, it's been able, um, it trains them in mediation skills and negotiation, um, and it has worked to ensure that they, these women's groups have access to visiting mediators and envoys. Uh, UN Women has also brought gender and women's rights training to the Malian military so that when, when they're fighting the rebels that they are able to respond effectively to women's needs. Um, they have supported market engagement to internally displace women, which are the refugees within the country. Um, and then they also conduct studies of what happens on the ground during times of conflict. Um, so again, you can look at the first site I've listed on the slide, and I'm going to address the second slide, which is um, what the U.S. is doing as a U.N. member state. Um, the U.S. as a member nation of the U.N. is obligated to enforce the, um, the plans for 1325, which was the first Security Council resolution. Um, nations um, have to develop their own um, plans called um, National Action Plans, and over 30 nations have now passed National, uh, nation, national Action Plans for Women, Peace, and Security. Um, and you can find more information about the U.S. National Action Plan on the second site right there. Um, President Obama in December of 2011 um, it called for a National Action Plan to be created and since then the State Department, the Defense Department, USAID and parts of the CDC have been working um, to draft their part in the National Action Plan and also to make sure that there are budget allocations to um, make sure that these happen. Um, and I'm proud to say that the organization that we represent, the U.S. National Community for UN Women, um, took part in all of this in you know, helping to create the National Action Plan. We were part of a civil society group called um, the Working Group on 1325. Now we call ourselves the National Action Plan and whatnot. But we helped to um, push to have Obama um, decree that this is what the U.S. should do. We've also been working with state and defense in consultation as they develop their plans. And we are also currently working with the legislative subcommittee to to make sure that this the um, the um, the piece of legislation, the Women's Secure Peace and Security Act, is introduced and then passed in Congress. So um, it's interesting to note the presentation for me by Cause spoke about social media, and I've given um, I've shown you that uh, we we are present on social media, and it's very important for you if you support these measures or these efforts to follow us online because. Um, 
one of our strengths is that we do have chapters across the country, and so when legislation is introduced that affects women both within the U.S. and globally, we can call on our supporters like you to to call your Congress um, congressional representatives and ask them to support the Women, Peace, and Security Act or the International Violence Against Women Act. We often do call, make those calls out on Facebook, or we tweet them. So um, please connect with us. Um, we'd love to have you part of our. Um, broad group of supporters. We need men and women, um, and we know that um, that people here in the U.S. support the rights of uh, women everywhere, so I ask you to join us. And I'd like to turn the presentation over to C.C. Sloan, who is the founding, uh, founding president of the Southern California chapter for um, UN Women. Thank you. Good morning. How are you? Good. Good. Uh, thank you for giving me this uh, opportunity to pay tribute to uh, women, wonderful women peacemakers. Actually, I really don't know anybody, any women that aren't wonderful. You are wonderful. But today, um, I, I want to mention uh, that we have been women peacemakers, as you know, for centuries. But today, I'm particularly honing in on the Nobel Peace Prize uh, laureates, and um, because of the leadership that they established uh, in their countries and that women have followed. Um, the most recent were in 2011, and there were three women from Africa and the Arab world in acknowledgement of their nonviolent role in promoting peace, democracy, and uh, gender equality. The winners were President uh, Ellen Johnson Sirleaf of Liberia, the first woman to be elected president in modern Africa, her compatriot, the peace activist Lema Gabawi, and Tawakal Karman, I'm doing my best on that, <laughs> of Yemen, um, a pro-democracy campaigner. The two documentary films that I have shown about these women, um, particularly the Liberian women, are Pray the Devil Back to Hell, which was made by Abigail Disney, and The Iron Ladies of Liberia, which really indicates a lot about how the women in Liberia who were mainly in friction over their religion, Christian and Muslim, decided to lay that down and save their children who were being scooped up by the warlords and um, change the whole face of, of Liberia. They were the first women to win the prize since the late uh, Wangari Mathai, particularly very dear to my heart, of Kenya. She was named as laureate in 2004. Her vis uh, vision for reforestation of Kenya has now reached 51 million trees in, throughout Africa. Her film is Taking Root, the vision of Wangari Mathai. And it not only is about uh, that vision of planting the trees, she had an affinity for trees, uh, but it was all, it's also about the whole history of Kenya, uh, going back to tribal life there and dictatorship, and uh, ultimately now, women who are through the planting of the trees, earning uh, money, cooking the right foods, bringing nutrition back to their families. Most of the recipients in the awards of 110 years have been men. And uh, to award these women uh, to me, shows an impetus to the fight for women's rights around the world, to other women. Also, in the 21st century, we can count on Serene uh, Ibadi of Iran. Her award was in 2003. She was a lawyer, is a lawyer, and human rights activist, uh, notably in the defense of women and children in her society. The most recent film about her, and it was actually shown on BBC in 
March of 2013, on Women's International Day, on March 8th, uh, is An Unfinished Woman. There are many, are several films of um, Serena Body to watch. You can find them on the internet. In 1997, uh, Jody Williams from the U.S. Uh, won jointly with the group that she coordinates, which is the International Campaign to Ban Landmines. Her work promoting the banning and clearing of anti-personnel mines. So in 2004, Serena Body comes together with Wangari Mathai and Jody Williams and to work on a plan for empowering women worldwide in the fight against uh, injustice, violence, and inequality. The plan becomes the Nobel Women's Initiative. The film about Jody is called uh, My Name is Jody Williams and it is a documentary and she, uh, her character was performed by Naomi Watts. I believe you can get that one too. Other laureates in history are women from Europe, Ireland, Albania, which was Mother Teresa, Sweden, Burma, Myanmar, and Guatemala. Um, that surprised me because, you know, Guatemala women Guatemalan women have been struggling for peace forever. I, I visited there, I met with a UN committee from Austria that was doing a program in uh, Guatemala, in Antigua. So, um, all told by my count, there are 15, 15 great women, uh, great women, and I also want to pay tribute to all the great male peacemakers in the world. We couldn't do it without them. Thank you. <laughs>